Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, Arizona's first woman governor, Rose Mofford, died this week. And we'll update the contested Republican primary for Congressional District 5. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon's Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Rachel Langang of the Arizona Capital Times, Jeremy Duda, also of the Arizona Capital Times, and Mike Sonics of the Phoenix Business Journal. The contested Republican primary in Congressional District 5 is contested no more. Rachel, it's over. We got a winner. It's kaput. Ball right, game. and Christine Jones conceded to Andy Biggs despite the very, very, very small margin between them. Uh, 27 votes at the end of the recount. Um, Biggs actually gained in the recount. Um, Jones lost some votes. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's over. It, it's taken quite some time. She had filed a couple lawsuits um, and agreed to drop them and concede. And here we have the final numbers. Jeremy, you were down at the courthouse when uh, all this was going on. Describe the scene. What was happening down there? Well, you know, the, you know, they certified the, uh, give the results to the judge. They certified it. You know, Biggs' lead went from 16 votes to 27 votes. But Jones filed this lawsuit on Wednesday, and she wanted all these uh, so-called overvotes where people were rejected for voting for more than one candidate counted or, or, or checked to see if they're all right. Provisional ballots added in. There's been a big fight all day. They've been filing legal briefings in federal court about this. So we figured this was going to drag on for a little while. Court empties. We interview, you know, Helen Purcell, Karen Osborne, you know, Biggs' legal team. Everyone leaves. We're just waiting for Jones. All of a sudden, everyone comes back up. The, the, the Jones team called him back up. They said they wanted to uh, go back on the record in court, and we all figured at that point, concession, that's what it was. Christine stood up, you know, gave kind of a speech, a, a concession speech, talked about the race, and that's the end of it. So the lawsuit's... Uh no more. Yeah, Jones is going to file the lawsuit, and that was all, or drop the lawsuit, yeah. and that was always really a race against the clock. The county is going to send all the information to the printers to print these ballots Monday at 5 p.m. That's the deadline. There's no way they're going to get this resolved. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge in, in some of these things because we have an August 30th primary, and uh, early ballots go out. People can start voting next month, and so that doesn't give uh, candidates much time to challenge these things. So it, it, it was a race against time, and she was really up against it. But you know, it was a big blowout. She lost by 27 votes. That's probably one of the closest races we've ever had of that stature in, in the state and she she could have challenged if, if she found that they were somehow you know not counting votes for her but counting votes votes for for bigs but but it, it's a tough hill and she's kind of run out of the options and and the clock was running out and again the, the suit was regarding quote-unquote anomalies and 577 rejected ballots um, that's a lot of ballots did she just think that this is every time every time she contests the lead gets bigger so it's kind of getting the picture there yeah I mean I think at this point I mean this was kind of always seemed like kind of a Hail Mary you know Jones has obviously you know, as we've seen from you know millions of dollars she spent in two campaigns now she has unlimited resources for these legal challenges and I think they, they were just trying everything throwing everything against the wall to see what sticks the first one uh, obviously uh, she won the case and uh, won the battle and lost the war lost it you know got 18 ballots out added lost you know, her lead, you know, increased from there. No reason to believe this thing might have turned out any differently, well, but uh, had it dragged out, it's possible, but again, yeah. the clock was running well, out. It is a better pill because she did put a lot of money in, a lot of her own money, what, 1.7, 1.9, you know, legal fees. And she was ahead on election night. And so she kind of came out and kind of gave a victory speech, and it looked like she was going to win, and she was going to be a big upset because Biggs was the anointed one in this race. And then they counted all the votes, and she was behind. And now they counted again, and she was in the courtroom. Biggs wasn't, and so it was, uh, you know, probably kind of upsetting to put all that money in there of her own. And this is, the, like Jeremy said, this is the second race where she's come up short. And yes, I don't think that'll be the end of her. I would bet that she's keeping an eye on things to run for in the future. Um, it, it shows that she's very close. Close to winning something. Uh, that, that's probably a good sign uh, if she wants to put a bunch of money up and then try to run for some other office, possibly congressional, possibly statewide. I'm not sure. Oh, and I asked her about this after everything was all said and done after the concession. She said, I'll tell you the same thing I told you two years ago. You know, not ruling anything out. And, you know, if there's and if an opportunity that um, right for it comes up, you know, I'll run for that. In the meantime, sounds like she's very interested in staying engaged on uh, some of the issues that kind of uh, cost her the race on 
fault on allegedly faulty signatures on ballots on uh, provisional yeah. ballots for people voting in the wrong precinct she f said she feels like this was decided in court not at the ballot box so she sounds like she's very committed to uh, you know staying very uh, she yeah. kind of smacks of Fred Duval. She's kind of a candidate. She's got some political chops. Those, those ads that she ran were very effective, but she can't seem to win any races. And, you know, she was close, but, you know, there's just a participant uh, a ribbon that you get out of these things. And we should mention that uh, with Biggs winning this particular <coughs> primary, he has basically won the seat. And I would imagine, are, anyone suggesting that the, there could be opposition, or any Republican opposition to Biggs in two years? I mean, it's always possible. I mean, some of these, you know, some of our, uh, you know, members of our delegation, they have primaries that we barely even realize exist. You know, David Schweikert had a primary. He won it by 20, by, uh, he got 80% of the vote against a guy probably no one at this table can name. So will he get a primary? Maybe, but will it be a real one? Probably yeah, not. Yeah, because but because Christine Jones benefited the fact that there were there were you know Stapley and Justin Olson yes. who were legitimate strong candidates and yes. then they did pretty well, and they kind of split the, the LDS vote and she benefited from being the only woman in the race. And I think if if she would go up against Andy Biggs next time, each against each other, that would be a much tougher thing, especially but as an incumbent for, never, yeah, yeah. with Biggs. All right, so uh, that race is decided. That issue is over. Bob Burns versus APS. Not over by a long shot, and the Corporation Commission, of which uh, on which uh, uh, Burns sits, they decided to kind of sort of help him a little bit. It, it would have been really rare to see them not hire an attorney, uh, considering he got sued. Um, and this stems from subpoenas that he filed uh, looking for campaign spending, um, any political contributions from 2014. Uh, there was about $3 million that flooded into that race, and he's been trying to disclose it since then. Um, they fired back, not only at the commission, but they filed a lawsuit against him, um, and he has to defend himself against a lawsuit. Uh, they've done that for the other commissioners in the past. Uh, for them to say, no, you're being sued and you don't deserve an attorney, even though you're acting in your official capacity, that would have been uh, pretty shocking. So again, uh, he uh, subpoenas APS to get these campaign finance records. APS turns around and sues him and says, not only do we want these subpoenas canceled, you're going to pay our attorney's fees. Corporation Commission considers whether or not to get an attorney to represent Burns. Right. It wasn't unanimous, though. A fellow commissioner didn't think it was uh, such a good right. idea. Right, and it was one who <coughs> actually had an attorney paid for uh, in a suit that he... Uh, was brought against him earlier uh, this year. And I talked with him today because, you know, it's sort of rare he's the low no vote. He said, I, I did want him to have representation, but they vowed to fight this to the highest courts. We don't want to give him a blank check. We want to make sure that we're getting updates on the cost of these attorneys, depending on how this drags out. And that's Bob Stump, of course, the lone dissenting vote. And I think uh, Burns actually mentioned the fact, as, as Rachel did, that in the past, representation has been offered. It was offered to Stump as Rachel mentioned, when he had his texting issue. Sure, I think, he, I think those legal fees went up to about $130,000, which is actually higher than the cap that a couple of uh, Commissioner Burns' fellow commissioners proposed putting on. They wanted a $100,000 cap on this. You know, Stump exceeded that, and this is, I think we all expect the legal fees to exceed that in this level. This is, you know, APS, they have plenty of resources. They're going to fight this tooth and nail. They're going to fight this tooth and nail. They say maybe all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Again, the commission was a little concerned about those legal fees. Uh, is anyone concerned that APS is fighting this much, this long, and willing to put this much into such a thing? All, that, all they're asking for is to find out who you spent money to help elect. The, the, the culture at APS and their approach to these types of debates uh, with Solar City and, and the ACC and other folks has been to, to be hardcore, to fight back, um, to, to fight kind of tooth and nail on these things. And you've seen some other cases, we'll talk about the 1070, where, where these groups that sue the government or somebody in the government ask for legal fees because you're really kind of limited to what you kind of collect when you sue a public official, but you can go after legal fees. I think there's a backdrop too around there that we've had all these lawsuits against the sheriff and against the county, and those legal fees have, have gone way up. And I don't see a lot of Republicans always concerned about those, but the public is. So I think that kind of played in here that, hey, we have all these, look at these sheriff cases out there, which are totally different, but you know, this is one of these things where we can see big legal fees, but it would be really strange, like Rachel said, for them not to defend him. But I think APS is going to continue to fight this. If you saw their letter about why they think these these subpoenas are, are fatal, this is this is hardcore, big picture stuff about the First Amendment and proprietary information. 
And it, the court case would be precedent setting. We would actually get a glimpse into how the courts view um, the rights of a, an individual commissioner, which there have been reasonable people who've disagreed on uh, what a single commissioner can do. Um, that would be something that, you know, maybe APS wants that, maybe they don't. I mean, yeah. it depends on how it goes. But definitely there's a lot of issues that the courts could weigh in on that would be beneficial going forward. The peril for APS is the discovery phase. Is, is if, if this goes through an, a, a long court battle, you, you open yourself up to being deposed by the other people's attorneys and you start getting into that. And so maybe you, you didn't obey by the subpoena, but you know, the legal process kind of brings light to some things. What happens if Burns isn't reelected to the Corporation Commission? Uh, I don't know. I would, I would imagine all, all, all this goes away unless whoever replaces him wants to uh, you know, continue this fight. I mean, if it's uh, Tom Chabin, uh, Bill Mundell, the two Democrats who are running for spots, they're both very big on the same issues, on, you know, you know backed by solar, anti-APS. I would imagine either one of them would continue it if uh, it's one of the other Republicans, perhaps not. What do you, what do you think? I mean, if, again, the APS is focused. They're suing Burns. If Burns goes away or does not win re-election, what happens? Well, the four commissioners, aside from Burns, who are on the commission now, have... Um, basically no interest in furthering uh, this. The other ones, um, the other Republicans, have been a little cagey on how they answer mm -hmm. it, or a, a bit cautious, I would say. Um, it's not exactly clear how or if they would continue it, but like Jeremy said, the Democrats definitely have put it out there that they'd be the ones to, you, to carry that You could see a lot of outside groups, if, the, if this progresses to the Supreme Court, you can see a lot of outside groups get interested because of Citizens United type things about what regulated entities have to disclose, what kind of powers state regulators have. And so this could, could really blow up into some really big legal issues. All right. Um, a big story this week. Rose Moffer died uh, at the age of 94. Um, just... Uh, for people who have moved here in the past 10, 15 years, they, they have heard of Rose Moffer, but really don't know who she was. Who was Rose Moffert? Well, just you know, one of the one of the probably the most beloved uh, political figure who had been left in Arizona up until a couple of days ago. I mean, she was most well known, of course, for. Uh, she, became, she was uh, kind of our Gerald Ford. She was Secretary of State in 1988 when Governor Meekum was impeached. She took over, and uh, you know, with her. Uh, you know, she, she was sort of a calm, comforting presence after about a year and a half of just total chaos, very, uh, very divisive times in the state. It's very, you know, so she was well known for, of course, her big hair as well, but uh, just for, you know, her kind of motherly presence, very calming and comforting. Kind of had a larger than life personality with the hairdo and just, you know, just wanting to hug everyone and be nice to everyone. But uh, she was governor for a few years and had to deal with lawmakers and had to get stuff done and decided after all this she wasn't going to run for re-election. Yeah, she didn't run and then Simonton <coughs> took over. Um, kind of a throwback to what the Democratic Party used to be here. Uh, Democrats used to be a lot stronger statewide. Um, so she was a throwback to that, kind of rose up through the ranks. Of, of state government. I think she started off as a secretary for, for the Secretary of State's office of the tax department. She was a big athlete too. That was always the thing we were talking about in the green room. Um, she played basketball and softball. She got invited on these traveling teams. So she was a bit of a, of a baller in her, her early and days. And I, I believe she was actually going to play professional mm -hmm. softball mm -hmm. until her father said, maybe you ought to, you know, maybe go into you know, state work and government work. And yeah, and that obviously worked out pretty well for her. It bears mentioning that she is Arizona's first female governor. You know, you kind of think, I think it's almost a default, at least prior to Ducey, that uh, think of governor, you think her, because four of our previous five governors had been women, and she was the first first of those. She was a total glass ceiling breaker in, in many arenas, it seemed, and I mean, I didn't know her, but it seemed like she was pretty dedicated to, you know, females in politics, and that's something that we never really have enough of, uh, and, uh, you know, that can be a great legacy for her. We had President Obama weighing in and, and <coughs> noting, you know, her passing and say, and recognizing that she was the first female governor and, and, and how one job she had, she was told um, she couldn't have it anymore because that yes. was a, man, a man's job. So that, that really can't be understated how, how important it is to be the first in something like that. Yeah, first woman governor and first woman secretary of state. And kind of one of the first, if not the first secretary of state, who ascended to the governor's office after problems in the governor's office, she would have gone there when Wesley Boland died, but because Boland appointed her Secretary of State, that wasn't allowed. No, and, not, and thus Bruce Babbitt, and <laughs> off we go. Sure, and, I, and um, she wasn't the first, but she was the first in kind of a long string of... Yes. Uh, you know, secretaries of state who rose up. You know, we had this trend of every governor who entered office through election starting in 1972, I believe, or it was 1974, left early for some reason. So you had 
for, for the past 40 years, you know, every Secretary of State has been around pretty much for a governor who entered office through election has gotten their chance. And she and was, she, uh, she and obviously she waited around long enough, elected uh, several times in her own right, so she got her chance. Yeah, yeah she was still active in a lot of Democratic Party uh, events after leaving office. She'd be at a lot of their, their dinners and fundraisers and you'd see her at things. And, and we're a state where sometimes when people uh, leave office, we don't see them around much anymore. And so she kind of hung around. Yeah, all right. Uh, Rose Moffer did at the age of 94. Um, it looks like, correct me if I'm wrong, but SB 1070, it looks like it's over? Yes, six years of uh, litigation in federal court through God knows how many lawsuits. And uh, the, I believe the last one, this is finally over, uh, the Attorney General's office uh, reached a settlement with a group of uh, civil rights groups who've been, who've been suing uh, primarily over uh, you know, section two, what's known as Section 2B, or a lot of people uh, derisively call it the uh, show me your papers provision. Mm -hmm. That's the one that says you know, police officers, if they have a re reasonable suspicion that someone is in the country illegally, they have to, uh, they have to check on that. But uh, Brnovich agreed that we're gonna, you know, he's gonna have an informal opinion, put some guidelines on this, try to uh, assuage people's fears that could be abused, because that was always kind of one of the cornerstones of the opposition to this is, you know, are people, are cops going to pull people over on suspicion that, you know, hey, that guy might be in the country illegally. That's something, you know, if stipulated, you know, you can't do that. They're going to put some other guidelines in about how long you can detain people while you check immigration status. The state's also going to fork over, I believe, 1.4 million in illegal fees, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how this thing ends. And both sides can basically say, all right, we got something here. Let's move on. Maybe, though I, I would note Jeremy said it's an informal opinion. You right. Know, if, if local <clears throat> law enforcement choose not to follow that informal opinion, um, you could have like monitoring groups who've been paying a lot of attention to this bring suits later to say, as applied, this actually is racial, racial profiling, not racial <laughs> profiling. Racial profiling. And, uh, You're in big trouble. I know. <laughs> and, uh, and that could still happen just because of the informality of the opinion. I, I think there's some peril here for, for Brnovich. He's a Republican. He wants to run for office again, maybe run for something more. And if you have kind of a hardcore immigration hawk running against him, I would run ads on this because he's detoothed the law that a lot of folks on the right, like the, we got a presidential campaign based on being hardcore on immigration. And when you have language like, well, you don't want to prolong a traffic stop. If we have some kind of Kate Steinle situation where some undocumented immigrant commits a crime and they can trace this back to the cops not not being aggressive enough, folks on the right will jump on that. And, and so whether this is a reasonable policy is one thing, but politically, I do think he opened himself up a little bit. Were you surprised the attorney general went this direction? Not in particular. I think a lot of the stuff that was <clears throat> that's going to be in this informal opinion probably isn't too surprising. I mean, um, the stuff about detain, about, you know, detaining while they check the status, that's been a major issue. And the stuff about, uh, not being able to pull people over. I mean, that was something that I believe supporters of the law back in 2010 when it was passed, where that was kind of one of their counter moves to, counter arguments to people saying this would be abused by uh, law enforcement, they'd use racial profiling, they'd say, hey, you can't pull someone over just for this, it's only if you pull someone over for another reason. And there are some parallels to the, the election fraud, the election law that Helen Purcell said they couldn't enforce, right? And so you got a conservative legislature, and then in case Brewer signing this bill, and then you have an executive, uh, in this case the Attorney General, saying, well, we shouldn't enforce <laughs> provisions of this or how we should enforce provisions of this. And so you've seen this a lot nationally in other states and here in Arizona where the legislative branch and, uh, passes something and then the execution of that uh, by the executives is, is, is in conflict. Uh, but I think it, it fits with the more moderate take on, on immigration that the state has had in the past couple of years. 1070 uh, is an Arizona of a few years back. It, it's not the, where we're currently at. People don't seem as interested in running immigration bills. Those sorts of bills aren't successful. There are definitely still those folks, those factors actions uh, in, in the state that want that, but it's not necessarily the main theme anymore. Certainly, and, and 2010 when 1070, I mean, this was by far the high watermark of this movement in Arizona, and you know, notwithstanding the national climate, the Trump, uh, the, the success of Donald Trump's campaign and all that, there's been so little appetite for more strict illegal immigration stuff post 1070, even though that was tremendously popular with the mm -hmm. voters. And I think, you know, we have a new governor now as well. I think Governor Ducey wants nothing to do with a lot of the illegal immigration debate. I think he's got other things he wants to focus on. This kind of came on, th this, this came about in 2010 at a very opportune time for advocates of strict illegal immigration enforcement. Well, I think we'll find out in November with Paul Babu running for Congress. Immigration's a big issue of his. The sheriff, who's in a, <clears throat> all by, by every measure, a tight race. And, you know, it, and, and certainly how Trump does here. And we'll see how, how immigration rates still. Um, 
But remember, uh, when a uh, Brnovich runs again, or when you know, in future elections, things change in a couple of years, so you just never know. Um, public employees and union work, as far as the Supreme Court, release time for union employees uh, doing uh, union work on the job. Sounds like the Supreme Court said it's okay because it's negotiated. Yeah, it was part of the CBA. Uh, this, is, this is the <laughs> issue between the Phoenix Police and basically Sal DeCicio and the Goldwater Institute over whether police officers can do union work on the clock. Um, and this is pretty common uh, throughout the country. But they challenge that, like, you know, at, under the gift clause. Can, can, should we really be paying officers to be doing union work when they're on the clock for the city of Phoenix? And the lower courts had sided with, with the conservatives on this. Yes. And then the Supreme Court, three to two, uh, sided with the with the, with the police union on this. And it'd be interesting if the court was a little larger, uh, like it's going to be how it would have ruled. Also interesting if uh, how it would have gone if one particular justice hadn't had to recuse himself, uh, the newest uh, justice, Clint Bullock, who came to the court from yes. Goldwater Institute. So obviously he couldn't take part in this case. Goldwater was one of, the, one of the main litigators in here. He recused himself and it was the judge who replaced him from the appellate court who sided with uh, the, the majority with uh, Chief Justice Bales and uh, Justice Palander. That's how you get to three to. Yeah, reverses the trial court ruling, vacates the appellate court ruling, basically says this is because, and, and again, because all sides benefit and it was negotiated, it's not a gift. Yeah, the, the, we, we struggle with this gift clause in, in the, the Arizona Constitution. This comes up when, when there's business subsidies or incentives or tax breaks for, for real estate projects or jobs, and, and you have folks on the right who don't like corporate welfare that bring, that, that bring this up. And it came up in this case because, you know, are we just paying these guys to do union work, right? That's kind of right. the, the, the conservative argument. But the courts have always had this kind of gray area on what's a gift and what's not. And they kind of went into that, that realm and saying both sides kind of benefit okay from this. Rachel, is the legislature likely to take something like this up in some way shape or form next session oh I hadn't even thought about that I suppose it's possible um, I know <coughs> that this has been a big deal for a lot of conservative uh, groups Goldwater has a lot of influence uh, at the legislature so it's definitely it's possible I, I don't know what sort of bill they would craft that would um, specifically only deal with this, or if it would deal with yeah. union work in general, or if it would deal with how you can make contracts. I'm not entirely sure. And, and not sure I'm, how far it can go, considering we're talking constitutional issue here. But I mean, this has to attract their attention. Oh, sure. I would be surprised if we didn't see, you know, probably a couple of lawmakers introduce legislation like this uh, next session. I'm sure the only thing that kept people from doing it so far was that Goldwater and DeCicio had been winning in court on this since 2012. Now, how far it goes, who knows? I mean, unions don't have a heck of a lot of clout down at the Capitol, but, you know, police, fire, that's a little different, especially. You know, there's a, you know, the law enforcement, public safety. Mm -hmm. Most unions, you know, they're not going to get the time of day from a legislative Republican at the Capitol. These folks, maybe a little more. These are the folks whose endorsements they seek out when they run for office, that kind of thing. So it'll be interesting to see if this actually gets some traction. Well, well the MO down there at the Republican legislatures, if they can do something to needle <coughs> democratically controlled Phoenix, Tucson, or Tempe, they'll, they'll do it. Well, and so I wouldn't be surprised. Speaking either. of that, the state versus the city uh, dynamic, we got the medical marijuana in that hotbed of socialism, Snowflake, Arizona. <laughs> what is going, what's this all about? There, there's a huge, a planned huge uh, marijuana growing farm up there. And in order to get approval, um, they had to pay, I guess, $800,000 to, to the, the town up there. And so you have folks down here, Republican lawmaker, Paul Boyer, doesn't like that. Um, and so we have a lot of big players in this. Fife Symington's son <coughs> is, is involved with this. You got Doug Cole. Is uh, involved with what? In the marijuana farm, I think. Uh, I think he's yeah. a manager, owner. Yeah, he's he's, a man, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you have a lot of folks down from down Phoenix. And so this is a, kind of a, a minefield when it comes to marijuana policy. And you've seen this in, in other states about how, how medical marijuana, or we could have recreational marijuana, how these things are implemented what kind of rules that, that towns and cities can, can impose on these. And there's folks down here that don't like the fact that you basically paid 800 grand to, to open up a big pot farm. It's also really interesting because it stemmed from a law that passed this year that allows any lawmaker to tell uh, the attorney general, this city's breaking the law and you need to investigate them. Um, and so we got to see kind of how it works. And so Brnovich says that, yeah, they are, you know, arbitrarily arrived at this $800,000 mark. Um, they're going to need to come up with like a criteria to get to that number um, or potentially end up in court. Sure. And a lot of this was over like, you know, public meetings, all that kind of thing. But Representative Boyer said they hadn't followed this. Now, prior to this this law, you could have pursued uh, you know, legal action on something like that. This kind of streamlines the process. You know, and, uh, you know, it goes to the Attorney General, goes straight to the uh, Supreme Court, I believe, after that. If the cities don't 
correct, you know, correct the issue if they don't deal with uh, find a way around to uh, this eight hundred thousand dollar thing. They lose about other state shared yes. revenue, massive chunk of uh, revenue for pretty and much every city in the state. That is the sore that hangs over the head. Is that that state revenue would be rescinded uh, if uh, found to have violated a state law. All right, good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we will hear how the city of Tempe has added technology jobs. And also on uh, Monday, we'll learn about concerns regarding the impact of development at the Grand Canyon. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, a program uh, aimed to help thousands of first-generation college students. Wednesday, learn about a door-to-door -door effort to get dropouts back in classrooms. Thursday, we'll hear both sides on Proposition 206, which aims to raise the state's minimum wage. And Friday, it's another edition with the Journalists' Roundtable. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simon. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.